now. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to discuss with you all today our recently published paper um, on the improved extratropical North Atlantic atmosphere ocean variability with increasing ocean model resolution. Um, I should probably introduce myself. Uh, I'm Casey Patrizio. I'm a postdoc here at CMCC in the CSP division. And uh, before that, I was a PhD graduate of Colorado State University, working with David Thompson and David Randall. Uh, but for this work, uh, I worked with uh, Panos and Claude Frank Newell uh, from the Sorbonne University and many other colleagues from CMCC that you can see listed here. And this work was funded uh, by the, a GPI project called Roadmap. And I have to say, I really enjoyed being a part of this project the first couple of years uh, here at CMCC. Uh, really great scientists, and I learned quite a lot. So yeah, I hope you all find this webinar really useful, uh, or at least somewhat useful, and please feel free to answer, uh, ask any questions at the end. So first of all, what do I really mean by atmosphere ocean variability? Um, so very broadly speaking, we can consider this to be either variability in the atmosphere or the ocean, which is associated with heat and momentum exchanges between the two media. And so because of this, it's generally characterized by variability in sea surface temperatures, uh, that is at the interface between the atmosphere and ocean. So as you can see in this plot below, uh, SSTs in the North Atlantic have been observed to vary across a wide range of time scales. Uh, and so you can see some decades are cooler or warmer than others. Um, and in general, as a scientific community, this is something we really care about, uh, particularly because uh, this variability tends to be associated with climate anomalies in neighboring continents. So for example, precipitation and temperature anomalies over Europe or North Northern Africa. And so focusing on the extratropical region, which is really the focus of our study, there have been a variety of mechanisms put forth um, for this variability. Uh, and so if we start from the atmospheric perspective, uh, it's very well known that the North Atlantic Oscillation drives surface heat flux anomalies, which lead to sea surface temperature variability across a wide range of timescales. Um, and with an SST pattern, uh, looking something like what we see in this plot on the right. So this perspective of the atmospheric circulation driving oceanic variability is really well established from many decades of research. Uh, but in recent years, there's increasing evidence that the ocean circulation may play an important role for low frequency variability in this region. And so most of the evidence for this idea comes from modeling studies. And this is because we really don't have good observations uh, of the ocean circulation. Um, and so as an example, here in the bottom right, I'm showing results from decadal hindcasts, which are just retrospective uh, forecasts that have been initialized with ocean observations. And so there you can see that variations in ocean heat transport across 50 degrees north uh, are really quite consistent with SSTs in the subpolar North Atlantic region. Um, and so this suggests that ocean circulation is playing an important role in this part of the North Atlantic. Uh, and so even more recently, there's evidence suggesting that this oceanic variability can in turn influence the extratropical atmosphere. And so this leads to two-way interactions between uh, the atmosphere and ocean. Uh, to complicate things even more, variations in external radio forcing, so for example, associated with changes in greenhouse gases emissions or aerosols, uh, have also been argued to play an important role in driving 
uh, variability over the historical record. And so overall, you can see a lot of processes potentially at play here. Uh, in general, climate models have been used to understand these processes, but also predict associated climate anomalies. Uh, so for example, recent studies have shown that even the NAO may be predictable on decadal timescales. Uh, and so I think this really motivates accurately representing these processes in climate models. Uh, however, as we all know, um, climate models are far from perfect, uh, and so they suffer from a variety of biases in both the mean state and variability of the coupled atmosphere ocean system in the extratropical North Atlantic region. Uh, and of course, this hinders the use of these climate models as tools for both um, understanding, but also regional climate predictions. And so one way to mitigate these biases is through increased model resolution. Um, and so, of course, uh, resolution is not uh, guaranteed to lead to a more realistic simulation, but uh, there have been some studies showing some promising improvements in a variety of aspects of uh, climate in the extratropical North Atlantic region. And so, for example, leading to improvements in mean SSTs, as well as Gulf Stream related variability. So I won't say too much more about these improvements, because in a few, in a few moments, I'm actually going to highlight some of these studies. For now, uh, I just want to introduce you to HiRes MIP, uh, which is a multi-model intercomparison project that we've used in our study and many others have used to investigate the effects that model resolution has on simulated climate. Uh, and so as you can see, a number of modeling institutions uh, have participated in this and each provide a variety of experiments run on both high resolution and low resolution model configurations. Um, so in particular, they provide a control run so that's with a fixed rate of forcings, a historical run, which is with time varying observed rate of forcings, future scenarios, and AMIP runs. Uh, th those are atmosphere only with prescribed SSTs. And so one useful aspect uh, of HIRA's MIP is that some of the institutions provided multiple members for some of these experiments. Um, and this is particularly useful for identifying some of the more robust uh, effects of model resolution. Hyros MIP, very useful, but not without shortcomings. So one of those is that the majority of the models uh, use the same ocean model, NEMO. Uh, and so I think this is being addressed in a future iteration of Hyros MIP. I just mentioned it here so that we keep it in mind as we interpret some of these results. OK, so next uh, I'll highlight some of those uh, improvements to extratropical North Atlantic climates that arise from increased model resolution. And I'll focus on studies that used HIRA's MIP. So first I'll discuss uh, mean state, and then I'll move to variability. But hopefully by the end of this webinar, you'll see that these two aspects are really quite related in this region. Okay, so the first study that I'll highlight is from Athanasiadis et al, 2022, um, showing that increased horizontal resolution leads to large improvements in the mean SST field, uh, particularly in the extratropical North Atlantic. Uh, which you can see below. So looking there, you'll see that the low res models suffer from this cold SST bias uh, at the end of the North Atlantic current, uh, otherwise known as the Gulf Stream Extension region. And previous studies have shown that this is related to the mean ocean circulation. So in particular, LR models tend to have a uh, two zonally North Atlantic, two zonally oriented North Atlantic current, uh, and relatedly a weak 
AMOC. And so this leads to uh, less heat transport into this region. Uh, these deficiencies generally improve as we increase the MOD resolution, uh, thanks to resolving smaller scales in the ocean, uh, particularly fine scale bottom topography, which is really important for shaping the ocean circulation in this region. So in this study, they also showed that uh, these improvements in SSTs are associated with improvements in the eddy-driven jet and European blocking. Uh, so just to say that model resolution also leads to other important climate impacts, uh, not just in the ocean. Okay, so coming to the variability, uh, many studies have shown that, um, sorry about this, just hide this, whoops, okay. Uh, many studies have shown that model resolution is really important for rep accurate representation of air-sea interactions over the Gulf Stream region. Um, and this is supported by Bellucci et al.'s analyses of high-res MIP simulations. And so this is what I'll highlight here. So in these plots, you can see uh, the covariance between surface heat flux and SST anomalies. Uh, for observations, as well as a variety of models from high-res MIP. And so in all cases, you see this positive covariance, which is indicative of the Gulf Stream-related variability driving heat fluxes into the atmosphere. However, the HR models have a much more realistic pattern. Uh, so you, if you look at the LR models, you can see that the, the covariance is quite a bit weaker and uh, there's the indication that the Gulf Stream extension is too zonally oriented, uh, as I mentioned before. And so in this study, they show that this is primarily due to increased ocean model resolution as we move from eddy param tries to eddy permitting. And so this just emphasizes the importance of resolving the ocean mesoscale in air-sea interactions over the Gulf Stream region. Okay, so finally, I just wanted to highlight um, some results from a, re a recent PhD graduate of CMCC, uh, Luca Fumus Polini, did some really nice analysis of the AMIP runs from HIRA's MIP, uh, and basically showed that the atmospheric response to meridional shifts of the Gulf Stream front become more realistic as the atmospheric resolution is increased. And so in particular, as uh, you can see in these plots, uh, there is a northward shift of the eddy-driven jet in association with uh, a northward shift of the Gulf Stream front, which is really only present in the HR simulations. Um, and the LR simulations apparently fail to capture this relationship. Uh, and so this suggests that atmospheric resolution may also play an important role in atmosphere ocean variability in this region. Okay, so very broadly speaking, I think we know from previous studies that ocean uh, or model resolution is really quite important for Gulf Stream related variability. Uh, but it still remains somewhat unclear whether increasing the model resolution leads to robust improvements in the atmosphere ocean variability when we consider the broader extratropical North Atlantic region. So this is the question we're addressing in our study, focusing on whether there are improvements and what the specific mechanisms are. And so we address this question uh, through analysis of the interannual to decadal variability of both low resolution and high resolution models from the high res MIP. And I'm showing those models here in this table. And so since the specific resolutions vary between modeling institutions, we came up with uh, our own definition of HR and LR. Uh, you can see on the right here. 
In general, most of the HR models have a quarter degree ocean resolution, while most of the LR models have uh, one degree ocean resolution, whereas the atmospheric resolution cutoff is a half a degree and is a bit more variable uh, in general between the different models. So then we analyzed uh, sea level pressure and different oceanic variables from the historical and control simulations, uh, focusing primarily on the models with multiple members in the historical runs. So that's uh, ECMWF, ECEARTH, and the HADGEM model, uh, which I've highlighted here in blue and red. Uh, finally, then comparing, we compared these simulations to ERA-5 atmospheric reanalysis uh, as well as observations from EN4 between 1959 and 2021. Okay, coming to some results now. Just to start things off here, I'm showing the leading EOF of winter mean SST anomalies in the North Atlantic and the associated sea level pressure anomalies. And these results are for the historical runs. And so you can see immediately that the HR models uh, shown in the top row do a much better job of capturing the tripole SST pattern and associated NEO-like sea level pressure that we see in ERA-5 reanalysis uh, shown on the left. Surprisingly, the LR models fail to capture this uh, very fundamental pattern. So in particular, they overestimate SST anomalies in the subpolar region and severely underestimate their relationship or their correlation with the NAO. Um, and in fact, if you look at the LR simulations, there really aren't any coherent sea level pressure anomalies associated uh, with this SST variability. And so this suggests that this deficiency is driven by the ocean circulation. So we can try to understand uh, the time scale dependency of this uh, SST deficiency a little bit better. And to do this, we average SST anomalies over this yellow box and calculate the spectra uh, and that's shown here. And so as you can see, the LR models tend to have uh, much more power on low frequency timescales compared to the HR models and ERA-5 reanalysis. And so this suggests that this deficiency we're seeing is related to the low frequency component of the SST variability, which is consistent with being driven by a slow ocean process. So we also found that this is not related to variations in external radiative forcing. So the results for the control runs are shown as the dash lines here. And you can see they're really quite similar to the solid lines, uh, which are the results for the historical runs. Finally, we also found that this is not related to differences in the spectra of the NAO itself. Um, so you can see on the right, uh, really quite similar between HR and LR models. And so everything here is pointing to something going on with the ocean circulation. So for the rest of the webinar, I'm basically going to focus on explaining what's driving these differences between the HR and LR models, focusing on the low frequency variability of the ocean circulation and its drivers. Just get a glass of water. Okay, so in order to quantify the role of the ocean circulation, uh, we followed a method from Marzocchi et al.'s 2015 paper and calculated two different stream functions from the meridional ocean currents. So I'm showing uh, the formula here just for reference. Basically, we calculated an upper ocean horizontal stream function this was in order to quantify variability in the upper ocean horizontal circulation. 
And then we also calculated an overturning stream function in order to calculate or quantify variability in the AMOC. Uh, and so as an index of the AMOC, we average these overturning stream function anomalies over the extratropical region between uh, 40 to 60 degrees north and between 500 and 2,000 meters depth. So all the results that I'll show on the following slides are for seven-year low-pass filtered annual anomalies from the control runs. And this is really because we're interested in the low-frequency component of variability, uh, which is relevant to understanding uh, the deficiencies or the discrepancies between the LR and HR models. Finally, just to note that you'll see that I haven't compared these simulated uh, currents to observational estimates. And this is primarily because uh, there are limitations in the spatial and temporal coverage of uh, ocean currents, observations of ocean currents. And so this contributes to large uncertainty across ocean reanalyses. Okay, just starting things off here, I'm showing the leading UF of the upper ocean horizontal stream function. And so right away, we can see there are large discrepancies between the HR and LR models. Uh, so in particular, the HR models exhibit uh, their largest variability in the Gulf Stream region. So we consider this as variability of the Gulf Stream current. Whereas the LR models exhibit their largest variability in the subpolar region. And so we consider this to be variability of the subpolar gyre. And so this is probably unsurprising given the results for SSTs that I just showed. It makes sense that the LR models would exhibit uh, more prominent variability um, in the subpolar gyre. But we can take this a step further now and try to understand what's driving this more prominent variability of the subpolar gyre in the LR models. And so the first thing that we explored were potential lagged relationships between the NAO and the leading principal component of the horizontal stream function. And that's shown in the panel on the left here. Uh, also showing on the right are lag correlations between the leading PCs of the horizontal stream function and the SSTs. So the reason we investigate these lag relationships is because previous studies have shown that the NAO can drive delayed responses of the ocean gyres uh, via surface wind stress and buoyancy flux anomalies. However, as you can see in these plots, this ocean circulation driven SST variability in the LR models uh, is not really linked to the NAO at any lag. So we don't find any statistically significant correlations between the NAO and uh, the, the horizontal stream function. And so this suggests that the atmosphere is not driving this variability, this ocean variability that we're seeing. Uh, and so it's likely to be coming from and a process that's intrinsic to the ocean. And that's what I'll show a little bit later. So this is really quite in contrast to what we see in the HR models uh, where there's a much stronger relationship with the NAO indicated by the red lines here. So we also analyzed uh, a subset of simulations in which only the ocean resolution was increased. And those results are shown by the orange line in these plots. And so in this case, you see a large agreement with the HR simulations in which both ocean and atmospheric resolution was increased. Um, so this suggests that ocean resolution is really responsible for the differences between the HR and LR simulations. Uh, and emphasizing, again, the importance of ocean processes. Okay, so the next thing that we explored uh, was the role of the AMOC. Um, this is motivated by previous studies 
showing that subpolar variability is tends to be associated with AMOC variations. Uh, and so it turns out the AMOC is really key to understanding the differences between the models. Uh, and so this is motivated here in terms of the standard deviation of the AMOC, which clearly indicates that the LR models have uh, much greater low frequency variance compared to the HR models. And so now for the rest of the webinar, I'm going to transition to explaining what's driving this larger variance of the AMOC in the LR models. Uh, and so since there are a few different steps to these to this explanation, I thought I'd give you a brief preview of what's to come. Uh, don't worry if it doesn't make sense now. Hopefully everything will be more clear at the end. So first, we analyze subpolar upper ocean density anomalies, uh, which are an important driver of the AMOC. And we found that these density anomalies tend to be related to salinity in the LR models, while they tend to be related to temperature in HR models and observations. Next, uh, we explain this in terms of differences in the upper ocean mean state of a key deconvection site. So I'll show that the, there's a colder, fresher mean state in the LR models, which then favors a salinity control of density anomalies in, in this region. And then finally, I'll argue that this ultimately promotes the greater low frequency variance of the AMOC, as well as different subpolar ocean variables that we see in the LR model runs. Okay, so First coming to the upper ocean density. So here I'm showing upper ocean density anomalies as well as mixed layer depth anomalies as a proxy for oceanic deep convection, both regressed onto a subpolar SST index. So this really gives us a sense of the upper ocean density anomalies and convection anomalies that tend to be associated with a warm SST anomaly in the subpolar region. So if we focus on the HR simulations first in the top row, you'll see that uh, warm subpolar SSTs tend to be associated with negative density anomalies in the subpolar region, as well as reduced convection in the Western part. Uh, so this is the so-called Labrador Erminger Seas. So since we know that warming reduces density, this scenario is suggesting that the SST anomalies in the subpolar region are driving the convection that we're seeing. However, if we now move to the LR models, you can see basically the opposite scenario. So in this case, we have warm subpolar SSTs tend to be associated with positive density anomalies in the subpolar region and enhanced convection. So in this case, it's impossible for the SST anomalies in this region to be driving the convection, the enhanced convection that we're seeing here. And so this suggests that salinity anomalies are playing an important role in this region. And so I wanted to show this more explicitly. So in this plot, uh, I decompose upper ocean density anomalies into a salinity related component and a temperature related component. Uh, I took the difference between the difference in magnitudes between these two components and then regressed that onto uh, the subpolar SST index. And so here, uh, green means that the density anomalies are temperature related, uh, which is clearly the case in the HR model runs, whereas the magenta indicates salinity related density anomalies. Uh, and this is clearly the case in the LR model runs. Interestingly uh, and importantly, the HR simulations uh, appear to be more realistic, uh, at least compared to observations from EN4, uh, which I'm showing here on the left. So this is quite an important discrepancy and ultimately it's going to explain the differences that we're seeing in ocean circulation variability. Um, if you bear with me, uh, I'll get to that in the end. 
Next, I want to just link this to the mean state. This is ultimately what's going to explain the differences we're seeing between uh, salinity versus temperature control density anomalies. So here, uh, I followed a method from Menry et al.'s 2015 paper, and we calculated the salinity versus temperature control of density anomalies in the Labrador Erminger Seas. This is the key deep convection region that I identified previously. And we also calculated the upper ocean mean salinity and mean temperature. And we've done this for each of the control runs in our study. And so as you can see, the LR models with uh, salinity control density anomalies in this region tend to have a, a colder, fresher mean state. Uh, and this is in part due to having a weaker mean AMOC, uh, as I discussed in the introduction. So in contrast, uh, the HR models, as well as observations from EN4, tend to have temperature controlled density anomalies and a warmer, saltier mean state. And so Menry et al. found a similar relationship in CMIP5 simulations, and ultimately argued that this is due to the nonlinearity of the equation of state. So when the mean state is colder and fresher, this means that salinity anomalies tend to have a greater influence on density. And so it seems that similar arguments hold for the high res MIP simulations that we've analyzed. Okay, so finally coming to the variability, which is what we're interested in understanding. So in this plot, I'm showing the low frequency variance of uh, two different ocean circulation indices. So on the horizontal axis uh, of the AMOC index and on the vertical axis of uh, the horizontal stream function averaged over the subpolar region. So you can see that the LR model runs uh, with salinity controlled density anomalies have greater variance in both of these ocean circulation indices as compared to the HR model runs. And so this link between uh, cold fresh mean state uh, associated with salinity controlled density anomalies is really quite well understood from previous studies. Uh, but why is this also associated with larger variance in the AMOC and subpolar variables? This is really the key to understanding our results. So the explanation we came up with is really quite simple. Uh, you can consider a positive AMOC anomaly, which transports both salinity and heat into the subpolar region. So in this case, the subpolar salinity anomaly will eventually promote convection and therefore act as a positive feedback on the initial AMOC anomaly, as well as uh, the subpolar variables. So this enhances low frequency variance. On the other hand, the temperature anomaly will act to hinder convection, acting as a, a negative feedback on the AMOC. And so for these reasons, we're hypothesizing that this positive AMOC salinity feedback is favored in the LR model runs that are more salinity controlled, whereas this negative temperature AMOC feedback uh, will be favored in the HR model runs that are more temperature controlled. Just checking my time. Okay. So... It seems that uh, these mechanisms are supported. Um, so here, supported by lead lag correlations between the AMOC uh, and different variables averaged over the subpolar region. So in particular, uh, the LR model runs, uh, the AMOC shows a much uh, a positive lead lag correlation uh, with uh, subpolar density and mixed layer depths. Uh, as shown in the top row here. And this appears to be largely related to upper ocean salinity shown in panel C here, as opposed to SSTs uh, shown in panel D. 
Um, this is because the SSTs, the warming that we're seeing, would actually drive uh, negative density anomalies. Uh, so it must be related to salinity. And this is suggestive of a positive feedback between AMOC and salinity anomalies. On the other hand, in the ATRA models, uh, we see that the AMOC has a much more asymmetrical lead lag correlation with upper ocean density anomalies and mixed layer depths. Uh, and in this case, uh, the correlation structure is related to SSTs, shown in panel D, and not salinity. And so this is also suggestive of a negative feedback between AMOC and subpolar SST anomalies. Okay, so coming to the end now, uh, just want to summarize the findings and then discuss some possible future questions. So we found that some of the LR simulations from the HIRAS MIP, uh, notably ECMWF, EC Earth, and HADGEM, overestimate low frequency SST anomalies in the subpolar North Atlantic region and then significantly underestimate their correlation with the NAO. Uh, we've importantly found that these deficiencies are really improved when the ocean model resolution is increased. Uh, and this is ultimately due to variability of the ocean circulation. So we, we found that the LR models have much greater low frequency variance of the AMOC and the subpolar ocean circulation compared to the HR simulations. Ultimately, we explain this in terms of differences in the upper ocean mean state uh, of a key deconvection region, which then promotes uh, different drivers of AMOC variability. So the LR simulations have a colder, fresher mean state, uh, which promotes an unrealistic salinity control of density anomalies, leading to a positive AMOC salinity feedback rather than a negative uh, AMOC temperature feedback that we see in the HR simulations. And so lacking sufficient observations of the ocean circulation, we can't really form definitive conclusions about the, the realism of these different AMOC mechanisms, but it does seem that the HR simulations are more realistic considering uh, the results overall and considering the observational comparisons that we have made. Uh, in any case, I think this really does emphasize the need for continued ocean observations, um, particularly uh, variables related to the ocean circulation. Uh, I also think it's important to consider uh, the, the potential model dependency of these results in, in future work. And so I didn't have time to discuss this, but some of the LR simulations that we analyze that don't use NEMO uh, don't appear to have uh, similar deficiencies that I highlighted here, and in fact, seem to behave a bit more like the HR simulations with more realistic SST variability. Uh, so for more details on that, you're welcome to check out the paper. Uh, finally, uh, we're interested in exploring the implications of these results for decadal climate predictions. Uh, and so this is actually ongoing work as a part of the EU Horizon Project aspect. Uh, and so since I have probably a minute or two left here, I thought I'd highlight some of the ongoing work that we're doing as a part of aspect. Um, and so if you mentioned all the way to the beginning in the introduction, I mentioned that pre some studies have, have shown that the, the NAO may be predictable on decadal timescales. Uh, and this is something we're really interested here, it seems to see in understanding better. And in particular, I've been focusing on understanding the role of atmosphere ocean interactions in the North Atlantic in decadal predictability of the NAO and whether model deficiencies contribute to spread in decadal scale for the NAO across different decadal prediction systems um, as shown in this plot here on the right. So there uh, I'm showing the correlation between the observed NAO and different uh, decadal hindcasts from the decadal climate prediction project. 
And so you can see that some models do a lot better than other models. And we're interested in understanding whether this is linked to deficiencies in North Atlantic atmosphere ocean interactions. Um, so yeah, hopefully we'll have interesting results uh, on this in the future. Uh, stay tuned for that. Uh, for now, I'll just thank you for listening and thanks for joining this webinar. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Let's see. Excellent, Casey. Thank you very much. Again, yes. I would like to apologize to everyone for uh, losing my connection at the beginning. We welcome uh, questions also. Feel free to raise your hand. Uh, in the question and answers uh, section, there is already uh, Franco Boscolo who would like to raise a question, I suppose. Franco, I don't see your uh, question in, uh, uh, you haven't typed it fully, so would you like to raise your hand or date, speak out? If not, there are other questions also appearing. So, uh, there's a question from uh, Justin uh, Mawanji. And I'm reading it out from the question from the as it is typed. Can high res high res MIP uh, be used to investigate atmospheric ocean responses to deforestation, afforestation, reforestation? This is uh, one question for you, KJ. Hmm. I can, Interesting. Should I read it again? No, I I, I heard yeah. it. Yeah, I there are lots of different applications for high res MIP, and uh, I think I'm excited to see more work coming out of this with regards to afforestation, deforestation. I'm not exactly sure that we could isolate that specific part, but um, and it, it's an interesting idea, and uh, yeah, I'd, I'd be excited to see, like I said all kinds of creative work coming out of high res MIP. This is indeed a little bit far from what you uh, presented here. But uh, yes, uh, let me also mention uh, there is a question coming in from Malcolm Roberts from uh, UK Met Office. Sure. Malcolm, I'm reading this for you uh, since you typed it down. Do you find similar excessive long time scale variability in CIMIP models. I mean, these high-risk MIP uh, simulations uh, contributed to CIMIP. So uh, yes. there are there are always questions in high-risk MIP about spin-up, ocean adjustment, etc. Any comments, uh, KZ? Yes, it's a good question. So I personally had not analyzed all of the CMIP simulations, but there have been some studies that have shown, um, have looked at this in more detail. And there does seem to be actually more models that uh, may underestimate low frequency variance. Uh, and so it's possible that there is a, a model dependency of results here. Um, I think still it would be interesting to look at dependency on mean state across the CMIP models and whether those models that have underestimated low frequency variance, maybe the mean state is actually not colder, fresher, like we showed in the LR simulations in high res MIP. Um, so yeah, in terms of spin up, uh, I think, yeah, that's a potential concern. Uh, I think in the high res MIP simulations, if I understood, they are run for a certain period of time uh, before uh, the control runs and before the historical runs to to try and deal with the spin the issue of spin up. Um, so hopefully that's not impacting the results too much. Yes, hopefully that's right. 
there is uh, Malcolm knows better. There, there has been a spin up. I'm saying for other people that uh, at least thirty or fifty years, uh, at least for Harry Smith. Hmm. Um, of course, as you mentioned, KZ, I mean these models uh, that we, you analyzed here, you presented uh, are mostly Nemo, and uh, at least your work indicates that uh, this is pro this provides an example of. Doesn't uh, increasing model resolution, ocean resolution is not a remedy for for all models for all systems. But yeah. at least here we can see that uh, uh, what what uh, what consequences uh, we we may have in a modeling system when uh, resolution related issues uh, play a role, as you demonstrated. There is another question, and we still have five minutes to go. So let me uh, let me raise this from the chat. From the chat, uh, Chris uh, Danik asks, uh, "Thanks for your presentation, comments." So, in frequency space, low resolution models have more variability. As far as I know, in wave number space, the situation is reversed. Can you speculate on that? Thing. You and uh, yeah, sorry, the, I have no mic microphone available. Okay. Ah, no worries. Um, yeah, that's an interesting point. So, uh, I, I understood. So, in wave number space, yes, the, the high resolution simulations will have more variance on s smaller scales in general. Um, and uh, in 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 frequency space, we're seeing the low res models have uh, greater variance um, on low frequency time scales. So this is something I thought about before at, at the beginning of this, and whether there's a relationship between these two things. But uh, we I couldn't personally come up with a good explanation. And uh, I th I think perhaps it may just be a coincidence. Uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't necessarily ex expand this to uh, anything more than um, a, a coincidence. It's particularly in this region. It seems to be more related to mean state as opposed to something more fundamental going on. Uh, so yeah, I, I I I'm sure I didn't answer your question directly, but uh, that's the best answer I could give. Thank you, Kese. Uh, one more question I see. Uh, since there is no raised hand, I will continue reading the questions from the session. Uh, so Teresa Costa is asking uh, Kese, uh, hi, thank you for the interesting presentation. Have you considered other boxes uh, for your regression analysis, in parentheses, figure about uh, upper ocean density? Uh, mm. Uh, density at 500 uh, anomalies regressed onto the standardized subpolar SST index. So, have you considered other boxes? And uh, it was uh, found that different models might have different deep convection regions mm. depending on resolution. Yes. So, the first question we have played a little bit around with boxes a little bit. Uh, so for the SST indices, the boxes didn't really matter too much. So we could, you know, expand that, decrease that, and the results are fairly similar. Referring more to the uh, Labrador Erminger Cs, uh, so the, the, the salinity versus temperature control in that region, there's some sensitivity to the box that we choose there. So if we if we focus more on the Labrador Cs, we see more salinity controlled density anomalies. If we expand the box to the to the eastern part, so into the Erminger Cs, we get more temperature controlled density anomalies. Uh, so some dependency there. Uh, in terms of the second question about uh, having deep different deep convection sites, yes, uh, it seems that. Uh, HR models have more of the convection in the Labrador Seas in the Western part. The LR models exhibit a little bit more convection uh, in the Eastern part. 
Uh, in terms of variability, though, it seemed that both LR and HR models um, exhibit variability in this Labrador or Minger C's that seem to be common to both of those models, uh, at least with respect to subpolar uh, SST variability. Uh, and so that's the reason why we chose that box centered on that region. Hopefully that answered your questions. I don't see any other questions uh, here. It is, in fact, we have just uh, closed the hour, KJ. Okay. Uh, and I may, if no other questions appear, just a comment on what you just said, KJ. Uh, maybe also the CIs uh, extent uh, mm. contributes to this deeper, uh, to having the deep uh, convection regions being different. Um, Again, I will uh, just to mention that generally we give an introduction of CMCC at the beginning of the webinar. So this was uh, skipped. Uh, it was so uh, wasn't able. I wasn't able to do that because I dropped my connection. We may add it to the uh, to the recording uh, at the end, and uh, we may close the session here. We close the webinar. I would like to thank everyone for joining. And uh, first of all, uh, you, Casey, for uh, your excellent work and the nice seminar. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Panos.